we're also the people that that create human experience in a way because yeah. The, the spaces we're in, if that's the thesis of this conversation, yes, in a way yes. they influence the way we think, yes. the way we feel, the way we uh, make decisions. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are in Los Angeles, California. We are gonna be talking about all things architecture, all things design, all things understanding what actually goes into building these buildings that we all have the pleasure and honor to actually walk into and be a part of on a daily basis. We are sitting down with Evan Bliss. Pleasure to be here, Alan. What's I love up? it. Yeah, it's love been it. too long, my friend. It's been Good too to long. To Evan and I actually yeah. went to high school together 10 years ago, and here we are now, later in life, just feel doesn't even feel like I don't think I could have ever predicted this in the best of ways right yeah this he's in LA yeah. doing badass work in architecture and design I'm in San Francisco doing badass work and interviewing so it's exciting that we both made the trek out to California and also it feels like we're just you know just it's tight. like coming home like, it's just like, like coming home my friend. we're just tight like we've had yeah. both good consciousness expansions from coming to California and we 100%. vibe we vibe greatly yeah. so um, everyone, I think it's so important. We're, we're, we're gonna start with um, some, some big history as we jump into things, but quick on Evan's background. I wanna introduce you guys to what um, his background is. So he has a Bachelor of Science in Design and Architecture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Then he has a Master's in Architecture from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Then he spent two years at Clive Wilkinson Architects. Then he spent one year currently board of directors of Los Angeles Forum for Architecture and Urban Design. And six months most recently as the design director at Alloy Architecture and Construction. And he is spent the last two months as an instructor at UCLA Extension Architecture and Interior Design Program. So you're already doing teaching now at UCLA's Extension Program, that's dope. You've had a lot of great experience at different architectural firms. Um, and you have a really good abstract perspective on architecture, which I love so much. So before we get into the nuance of that, let's do a big history synthesis on reality. Here we are, evolution, long period of evolution. We're stewards of Earth now. We're hockey sticking up in population and exponential technology. What is your current synthesis of the state of humanity? Current synthesis of the state of humanity. Well, that's a big question for, from a big, big person, Alan. Um, I love that. Okay, so obviously I'm going to have my specific lens on it. So I, I, I think it's best that I speak about it in terms of uh, in terms of architecture. So I might have to start a little bit abstract for myself and kind of parse out what uh, what parts of that I'd like to hone in on. Um, I think I think over the course of talking to you over the last couple of days, maybe it's become apparent that. I think culture is really the part of, of humanity that most interests me. Uh, I think there's a lot of other practitioners in architecture, in, in other uh, technical and artistic disciplines that very much concern themselves with, um, I guess, the notions of uh, how do we, you know, how do we mitigate uh, overuse of water? How do we u utilize sustainable materials? How do we uh, use the raw matter in the most efficient way. I, I would say for me, I'm, I'm equally interested in how do we, uh, somewhat in the Elon Musk sort of way, how do, we, how do we assure that the future that we're pursuing is one we're excited about, which to me is essentially a cultural problem. So I would say that everything I do in architecture is, uh, is with that in mind, with that approach in mind, that it's really about curating a cultural condition through design and architecture that that makes life a really compelling experience for everybody, right? I, love I know that. that's abstract, but I think I, we that's can a good unpack one. that that's a, that's yeah. a good one because yeah. when when we when we look around us, we, we spoke a lot about communication. We're gonna dive 100%. a bit into some ethos yes. stuff in a little yes. bit. But when 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 we when we look or when we talk to people, communicate to people, the you know the buildings that we go into also communicate to us, and we yes. communicate with them. So building them in a way that gets us excited in a sustainable and ecological yes. and technically exciting way um, excites us as a communication fabric for where we're heading. So that's good that you have that lens, and then. I want to ask you, you know, as we get more into the weeds, one more kind of abstract point Please. with yeah. that is we looking around us here in downtown Los Angeles, we have a lot of, 
you know, a lot of these, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, mid 1900s style uh, construction where things look uh, a little bit more, and you can obviously describe this better, but concretey, uh, bricky, um, sure, yeah, n- sure. non non porous, monolithic, yeah, buildings. which I would argue, Alan, that that's interesting. You hit immediately on that. I would argue that that manifestation is a direct cultural message that's being sent. As you can see, a lot a lot of the names you're seeing on these buildings are banks, they're uh, accounting firms, they're uh, the the vestiges of the financial industry, right through conveying a message about their prominence through architecture. Um, so I think that's a great example, really. And now my uh, follow-up to that is, where would you like to see? How will you, because you have so many good actual designs that you've made yourself of the future yeah. of architecture, where do you see us transitioning as the newer era of buildings come into play? 100%. Well, I think it'll be far less um, hierarchically oriented. So I, I think there's sort of certainly this kind of attitude about, as you say, a a monolithic quality of institutions asserting their dominance over the population in a way. Not to not to make this some sort of uh, power struggle dynamic necessarily, but I I think that's certainly imbued on every level. Um, I look at design as having a value in the sense that it can certainly bring people together. It can um, it can be a mechanism that allows the collective cultural values to be projected. So it's not only um, kind of a temperature reading of how people in our society are feeling because we're driven I mean I, I think architecture is just as, as um, kind of ad- adhered to market forces and adhered to cultural forces as any other discipline but it also has that element of, of the practitioners being uh, the folks that are both both interpreting what's happening on the ground culturally amongst people but also projecting a kind of collective ideal that they see for, for design, like design being both a, a, a passive and an active um, intervention mm-hmm. in society. Um, so I, I've always thought that it, design is actually political in a sense, right? It's, yeah. it's not necessarily in the left versus right way, but yeah. in the sense yeah. that it influences... Uh, culture, like you were saying culture. earlier. Yeah. yeah, it influences the structure and the, and the, um, the kind of interrelations of people. Of people. Yeah. So, so when, you, when you build a building without the intention of people connecting to Earth, Yes. then people don't get to connect to Earth. Exactly. But when you build it with yes. porosity for natural light to come through, like the holes of a sponge, and when you build it with the intent of it being ecologically friendly, that you can breathe in fresh air from from trees, that you can see green around you, that you can um, yeah. have the proper recycling systems, all this type of um, stuff inside, that, you know, that further connects people um, in... Okay, let's jump into a little bit more um, of this nuance now. So, okay, so you find yourself you find yourself doing architecture and design um, through the through through uh, a bachelor's and master's, and then you you know you get yourself out in Los Angeles. You're going through these firms. What is one of these you know these these profound takeaways for you as you're going through the different firms? Because people design different buildings. There's office buildings, there's hospitals, there's schools, there's residential. There's so many different designs and they all have somewhat of a similar, you have to lug materials in, you have to do electrical. There's practical concerns, always. And air conditioning and plumbing, etc. All this stuff and there's contractors and yeah. So it's, tell, yeah, take teachers about this. It's really a dance, right? I mean, so I, I look at the architect as sort of the, uh, what would you say, the, the conductor of the orchestra in a way. Like we're not, we, uh, we have the asset and the advantage of being, by our training, generally uh, generalists, right? We, we have to know a little bit about everything. We have to know enough to be dangerous in all those various disciplines and, and considerations you mentioned. Um, and, and in practice, that, that turns into us kind of guiding the direction um, in the intent of each one of those individual practices. So whether it be in a particular building, the, the ventilation system has a really strong impact on the end result of the design or it's, it's, it's deeply part of the conceptual understanding of this building, then the architect needs to be adept at communicating that to their mechanical engineer to make sure that that part of the building is, is done properly within the kind of design direction. So. 
that's really what we are, is we, we have our deep domain expertise in architecture where you know, we, we have our rudiments, we, are, we're, we know how to draw, we know how to create imagery that sells an idea, we know how to create imagery that um, digests and unpacks the technical data behind the designs we make. But at the end of the day, I, I look at us as, uh, once again, kind of communicators uh, with, with a broad constituency of other professionals. So it's, it's, for me, it's very liberating for a, what I would say a person like me who's, who considers himself a kind of a, a 40,000 foot type, type thinker. So walk us through this as you're going through these different firms and you're going through school and whatnot. How are you actually dealing with offices, hospitals, schools, residential? How are you picking? How do firms book? How do the schools and hospitals and stuff uh, generally contract the stuff out? How do you then generally contract out to the different engineers and civil, civil engineers, plumbers, electricians, etc.? Sure. How does that whole entire thing happen? Well, it's, it's really, a, I would say, a professional ecosystem not terribly dissimilar from any other one in the sense that um, you have, generally you have a team that's, that's kind of uh, ongoing because these things are all about relationships, right? When, when you work with one structural engineer, they start to understand, maybe not your style, but the way that you might structure your designs or your architectural thinking. So they can be one step ahead and, and kind of help you help you improve uh, your ability to execute on those designs because they're, they're uh, preemptively sort of reading uh, what you might do. Uh, you build up that rapport and that relationship with your consultant teams, uh, with your structural engineers, with your mechanical engineers. And it also just in, improves the speed to market, right? If, if you have a team, if you've, got, if you've got a few guys or girls, you can call um, right away when you get projects and you know they'll help deliver what you need. It's, it's, it's frankly just like any other industry. It's, it's all about relationships. And, um, and once again, any time in the creative fields as well, that there's that kind of extra layer of, of something beyond just the practical and just and just the financial and it, it's not just about hey which engineers got the cheapest fee you know it's a, it's also about who, who's going to help me really uh build that badass cantilever that the city the city will approve and, and knows and knows and is willing to tackle that problem of uh of a you know an avant-garde structural design because i in my experience i found that Sometimes you, you do encounter engineers that, that will tell you you can't do something, but there might be a way to do it. It's just, it, it just takes a lot of work. <laughs> so, so like anything, it, you have to, you have to kind of love it uh, to make it happen and want to make it happen. Let me see so, if I can hit this. So you so want then, a team that loves it, right? Yes. Yeah. So let me see if I can hit this. So then um, you'll, get a, you'll get potentially um, a hospital, school, office, et cetera, will we'll look at a bunch of different architectural firms and they'll maybe yes. reach out to them and then those architectural firms will provide, you guys will, um, will sketch things out by hand and then by CAD and, and, and explore what it would be like to submit you know, designs for them. And, and then something that's interesting that you were teaching me about and then that, you, know, you obviously go off if you, get the, if you get the bid and go out and contract people and actually go and build it out. Um, yes. but, you were teaching me a lot about ethos. I thought this was really interesting. You guys worked on a project that was uh, for a uh, medical facility for physical therapy. Yes. Um, and so you had to design the interior of this building to be very, um, for, for different physical therapy, you want to inspire people, but for like a traumatic brain injury, you don't want it to be like too bright and too excitable and stuff like that. Yes. Um, so yeah, so teach us about how you blend when they give you an ethos, how you design towards that ethos. 100%. I, and that's just on, that's on the money for, for how I frame up uh, really any architectural design problem in, in an office or otherwise. Is, Starting with uh, what are the what are the real cultural and human implications of this design brief I've been given by a client. So that particular project you're alluding to was I would number one I would say was incredibly unique. So it it was a project I was privileged to work on at uh, at Clive Wilkinson Architects that you mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, it was also it it was framed up in a very unique way because the client understood our office's particular expertise in office design. So we'd been known for quite a, quite a period of time, probably 20 plus years as being um, really a firm that understood how to create an open office, which uh, for better or for worse is, is getting a little bit of cultural pushback now, but understood how to make an open office that 
really communicated the ideals uh, of an organization, of a company, and also created a space in which they could work most effectively. So it, it started with culture. It started with interviewing the executives, with interviewing the project managers, interviewing the staff to understand intimately what, what are their needs, both practically and culturally, to best do their work. So uh, this Rehabilitation Institute in Chicago came to us with that knowledge and asked us, can you take that particular approach and apply it to our design problem, which is how do we create a rehabilitation institute that breaks down the barriers between those who practice the rehabilitation, those that are on the ground actually helping people physically in real time better themselves, get back to you know, full mobility. How do you fuse that with the kind of um, the research that's happening on the other end, in, perhaps in, a, in an isolated institution, physically, geographically, intellectually separated from the actual work that's being done. And they were convinced, and, and we agreed that, that some of the principles that we had developed through our office design experience could be applied um, to this institution. And then how do you go about taking an ethos like that Yes, and then abstract. actually bring it into designing the space. 100%. So, um, a couple things. The design problem itself, the client asked us to do, uh, that we design the patient experience, which is a very abstract ask. But we define that as what the patient sees, experiences, feels from the minute they show up um, to, to when they've came up to the floors when they're, when they're actively being re rehabilitated, that whole narrative along the way is what our problem is, right? So that, that manifested in very uh, simple but provocative and thoughtful ways, I would say. Um, one of them being that graphics were a very strong component of, of what we did. So thinking about architecture not just as um, bricks and mortar, but also as surface treatment, as the way that you think about colors and the way that you think about how those colors affect one's mood and one's understanding of what the space they've just entered represents or is trying to do for them. So a really good example is how we thought about the ambulance entry, which I think I already yeah. mentioned to you. It's so cool, um, yeah. Which is, you know, it's such, a, it's such a simple idea, but it's like, how do, these, how do these patients come into this space? How do they come into this rehabilitation institute? If they're coming in on an ambulance, they're on the back, right? And they're in a very traumatic state, like in a very compromised state, and they need they need something that really envelops them and, and reassures them and lets them know that they're at a place where people care and they're here to help you, right? So the way that we translated that was we, we thought about the, the kind of entry bay to the building rather than it being this dark, dank, utilitarian, forgotten space where there's, you know, there's water leaking, you know, there's cracks in the walls, everything's just dismal. We thought about it as a place of, of not overstimulating, but something that kind of projected an air of freshness, of cleanness. So it's, it's these kind of curvilinear graphics that are orange tones, which are kind of the brand tones of this particular organization, and just kind of projects this idea of, of, of coming home in a way, right? Through, through this graphic treatment. Um, there's like a heart, and there's, is, exactly. yeah, there's a compassion yeah, feeling towards exactly. it. Exactly, that's yeah. a great, thank you, yeah. that's Thank you for those words, uh, compassion, precisely. So it, it, from, from day one, from moment one, we're communicating something. Um, and then I can kind of walk you through the building. Um, so this, this particular project, it was broken up into, I believe, four or five floors, each floor dedicated to a, a particular rehabilitation type, whether that be uh, sort of arms and hands, so people that have hand in injuries and have these kind of micro-scale, um, fine-grain maneuvers that they have to to kind of relearn or, or go through that experience of relearning those that are basically need to relearn how to walk <laughs> so the kind of legs and walking floor as you alluded to those that have brain injuries traumatic brain injuries that are, it's it, it's a very different experience from that very physical side of, of rehabilitation and then and then I believe just a, a strength floor for those that just mm -hmm. have kind of need to be rehabilitated in general strength Damn, so you're designing a different aesthetic and environment for every single one of those um, physical yes. areas for right. rehabilitation and treatment, yeah, therapy. That's so cool. Right, and, and the thing is that I, I think where this really became a novel approach is if you think about, if you just take a second and you think about 
what does a hospital look like? What does a rehabilitation institute look like? It looks very monolithic, right? It's, it's, we see the, you know, the drab hallways, the endless kind of beige, yeah, this yeah. very, uh, frankly, an environment that's, I think, inherently not conducive to what, what we're trying to do for the people that are in the space, right? Um, you need something that's catered to them, that, that is catered to their emotional state, not just the practical solving of, you know, how do we get you back to strong again and, and active again and capable again, but how do we, this is just as much an emotional thing as it is a physical thing. Um, so that was front of mind when, when we were designing these spaces. So each of those spaces, it, it, in a very real and physical way, manifests differently. So I was, I was charged primarily with designing the, the brain floor, which differentiated from the, the kind of the arms and the hands and the, the strength and the, and the legs and walking. It needed a very, um, at least by our measure, from, from thinking about it critically, from speaking to the leadership at the Rehabilitation Institute from actually visiting there. I got to fly to Chicago, meet with the staff there to actually see what was happening and understand that intimately. Um, it was understood that this brain floor needed a very, uh, almost kind of a nurturing sort of aesthetic and a nurturing sort of organization and sense to it. So it, it's organized in a way that um, all the kind of more active parts of the rehabilitation are happening on the center of the floor, right? And then on the edges of the floor, on the periphery, are these kind of sculptural type uh, scoops and, and, and gestures. Uh, if, if your listeners go and, and take a look at we're this, gonna, see. We're gonna plug yeah. in these okay. images, you'll be seeing them right now, yeah. Awesome, yeah, exactly. awesome. So you'll understand that they're, they're kind of these scallop type shapes, almost like spherical or almost arch-like, that have a almost ancient softness to them um, that are also, uh, covered with these soft blue graphics that it feels almost like a sky, like almost the, 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 the mist and the, and, the, and the gradient of the sky enveloping you. So that's where these very sensitive uh, rehabilitation actions are happening. It's kind of on the edges. Um, but it's simultaneously projecting this idea and this intention of intimacy by creating these little break off nooks, but also understanding that there needs to be a, a clear dialogue happening on across the floor that the activities that are happening, the rehabilitation that's happening in the center of the floor needs to be physically and, and communicationally proximate to the kind of edge conditions. Yeah. Um, it was so, so nuts listening to you talk about this because it, it's, this reminds me, this continuously reminds me about the sheer complexity of the world around us. Like when we walk into a restaurant, we're not actually thinking about how they source the food, the yes. bussers, the waiters, yes. the chefs, the management, how they design the actual uh, venue where you're sitting, all this kind of stuff. Same, similar to when the future is not these monolithic buildings with these hospital hallways yeah. that are just beige and whatnot, but it's this warm and inviting all the way from when you first park your car, it's a warm and inviting environment for you to come in knowing that you're gonna be compassionately taken care of. And then there's a different on every floor for every single different um, treatment, every therapy that's happening here. So thinking about it in that lens is totally part of this future of where we think about design in a new way and I and I, and I love I love that um, yeah. now now that that's a really good powerful example for hospitals now I want you to also touch on the ethos for offices this is also yes. interesting so you'll you'll be going and you were talking about this you flew to Chicago to talk with them you know when you have these 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 uh, these meetings with let's say the company that's coming in that wants their um, that wants their office design, you'll have a conversation with them about their ethos, about what they want to see yes. in their office. And then you guys manifest that through your designs. And so tell us about that process. Right, well, you know, frankly, Alan, I, I don't think it's terribly different than what you do. Fascinatingly enough, I think, I think we all think, uh, you know, architects and designers, they're so much different than me or that what they do is, is so unique. And, and perhaps it is in some ways, but. I think it's really just about asking great questions, which you spoke to in, in a lot of your work. Mm. And I think great architects know how to do that with their clients. Like they, they know how to ask the right level of questions that it's, it makes enough assumptions that you can frame up what you're perhaps trying to uh, get from them, from the conversation, but not so specific that it, it, it forces a certain answer, right? Which is a very difficult yeah, thing to yeah. do. And it's, it's, 
it's a very human and a very uh, emotional and a very um, soft skills approach, right? So, and I think the thing is, from my experience, that uh, you get different types of clients too. Um, I would say in offices, they tend to be a little bit more oriented that way naturally. Like I think they understand that their organization is a complex organism and then has all these particulars about it that, that they're asking you as the designer to kind of parse through and assess and then give them, deliver them an, a solution that uh, is, is filtering your subjectivity of what they are through the practicality of, of, you know, this is how the desks are arranged, this is what materials we're using, this is the natural light we're, we're, we're bringing into the, to the building. It's, it's a high level question, not, not so much a laundry list of, of, of preconceived answers about, I, you know, I need this many desks or I need this many soft chairs, I need this many floors even. I, I think the best office projects I've ever worked on, have, they've started more abstract and then you end up with a result that could never have been predicted on day one and, and, I, and that's in a, good, in a good way, not, not in just a, a crazy way. Um, and one example I can think of I, I actually only had a kind of a relatively small part on this project, but it was a, a project we did at Clive's office for a French advertising agency, P Publicis Group, which perhaps you've heard of. Yeah. They uh, had asked us to design their new New York, North American headquarters in New York City. And they, uh, they have zero assigned desks in the whole complex. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Which is kind of incredible, yeah. right? It, uh, and that's just something that I, I don't think could have ever been generated if, if, if day one conversation was, here's how many employees we had, which I'm sure that conversation was had. It's like, yeah, here's yeah, how many yeah. employees we had. But, but the, the boundaries and, and the question was loose enough that you could say, it's not about how many employees we have, it's about what do our employees need? Mm -hmm. Do they need to be tied to a desk? Do they perhaps instead need many different working options? Can we provide a, a whole gradient and a whole milieu of different choices for these uh, workers that you come in every day and if it's if it's a heads down focus day we have that environment that we've yes. created for you whether it's a private it's a private booth it's a yeah, phone yeah, booth so it's um, it's a conference room just for you and your four closest associates to hash out mm -hmm. you know a really important problem or maybe some days like you need that coffee bar that yeah, yeah. that really central hub inside the office where you can all convene and you can trade ideas and you can really get a, a read on what everybody's up to and, and perhaps translate that into what your work group is doing. So it's, that's really what I mean. I, I hope that's a more tangible and practical way of saying that's, that's how you start with culture as a designer. I yeah. love that. I love that. Your, your emphasis on culture and communication exactly. and ethos yeah. in, this, in the push for design is so incredibly important. And I'm glad that you're disseminating that as your first principle. And 100%. a lot yeah. of the prominent architects that you surround yourself with carry that as their first principle. Exactly. So that's how yeah. this, this is a good dissemination for other people to latch on and be like, whoa, we should be seeing the world through, through this lens as we construct and build. Um, I want you to speak on <clears throat> on technicalities. Sure. So yeah. um, there's is it two leading uh, softwares, Rhino sure. and Revit, are the leading softwares for designing. I would say in a contemporary environment. Yeah. Yes. In a contemporary like, environment. Yes. And yeah. so when you're when you're using um, these softwares this is kind of like in a in a little bit of like a three-dimensional computer aided designy style CAD environment and you're able to take what you're visualizing from that ethos and communication with the 100%. org and put that into a, a digital yeah and then so tell us about that and then how that how that um, the technical tool will then translate into the final product yeah I love this I love this Alan because it I want to make a micro aside before we cool. jump right into that. I, I think you are giving me a great, uh, you're providing a great example of why the outside, the outsider is sometimes the best person to have a conversation about a field because they're not going to make the same presumptions about the conversation. Because one thing that sort of exists in my field is a, a really, um, what would you say, almost uh, uh, oppressive uh, kind of 
separation between the technical people and the, the design people. And I love that <laughs> this conversation right here, it's like we can talk culture, but now we're going, let's like talk about software. Let's talk about yeah, yeah, like yeah. what do you, you know, what's the super technical in the weeds thing that you're doing? By the and way, I'd tech love companies have the same issue with yeah. engineers and salespeople. Exactly. The Precisely. Same, yeah, yeah. That's a great way to characterize it. And I, I think that just speaks to the, it's a very human thing. Like, and I, and maybe that's the other vision for the future for, you know, I think collectively, maybe yeah. we can start to bridge that divide. Yes. But to get into your question specifically, so I, I, I'm very much aligned with Revit. I, that's what I use every day. And I, there's, there's haters, there's lovers of Revit. I, at this point, honestly, man, I'm, I would, I'd put myself in the lover's camp. It, uh, it's just so, so useful. It, where, where it differentiates from other softwares, and I don't know how much your audience is familiar with you know, CAD drafting softwares or 3D modeling softwares, um, how they've really existed in the past is that when you model something in 3D or when you draw a line in the, in the AutoCAD space, that line doesn't have a property beyond just being a line or a volume. Like the software doesn't have the intelligence, it doesn't have the data mining to assign the properties of what that thing actually means. And by thing I mean when you, when, you, when you extrude or you create a, a, a volumetric rectangle in a 3D modeling software, you're representing a wall if you're, if you're modeling architecture, right? You're, it has a thickness, it's perhaps four and seven eighths inch thick, which is pretty standard with you know, a, a two by four stud and then your five eighths jib board on either side. Go super micro here for you. I love that, that's great, uh, that's great detail. High level yeah, micro. I love that. Um, but what's incredible about Revit is that it's what we call a building information modeling software. So that's BIM mm -hmm. uh, for short. And cool. what that means is when, when you're drawing a wall in Revit, when you're drawing that, that one hour rated four and seven eighth inch wall, the software actually has a whole list of properties associated with that, um, automatically generated. So there's kind of, oh cool. It's, it's less like starting super abstract and it kind of gives you a kit of parts in a way that yeah, you start yeah. with. So Sketch do, does that yeah. a little bit too for the, Sketch, yeah. yep, for, um, for technical uh, people that are building uh, in interfaces for, uh, like user interfaces for apps, that they have sure. these sort of little kit components. They're like little plugins that you can 100%. plug in that, that's interesting. Yeah. Just a quick, quick ahead, question. Please. Why four and seven eighths instead of ah. five? Like, what's the deal? Great what's question, the deal man. with that? Great question, man. I know. <laughs> well, well, you know, I think it's, oh, gosh. I mean, you might know this. This is, I would say this is relatively common knowledge if you know anything about construction is, so there's nominal dimensions and real dimensions for studs, right? Like when you hear somebody say a two by four, a two by four isn't actually two by four. What? It's not? Right. It's, what is it's, it? It's two one and a half by three uh, and a half inches in profile. So, right, there could be different lengths of the two by four. Two by four just simply means Two cut through inches. it, it's it's the actual yeah. dimensions, the yeah. length and the height, right? Yeah, yeah, two inches, four inches, uh, as a piece of wood. Exactly. And what did you say it actually is instead? It's and actually... I hope I'm not misspeaking here. The standard is, it's usually four and seven eighths, so I hope my mask coming out right there. It is. Interesting. If you have the five eighth inch gypsum board on either side, oh, sheathing, interesting. gypsum board <laughs> sheathing on either side. Four and seven eighths. So, okay, but, uh, sorry. Instead anyway. of instead of going super technical, why don't you do this? Because you're you're actually you're hitting on something interesting. Tell us about these other component modules that sure. you plug in, because that was an yeah. interesting one. What are the other ones? Can you just like oh, yeah. click on like something to help you with like the electrical and the plumbing? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I'll, let's. I love this. Let's go super technical. So this will it'll require a little bit of history about how architecture uh, is practiced. So. In the past, when we were coordinating with our mechanical engineers or with our structural engineers, we would trade what we call CAD backgrounds. So an architect would generate their kind of latest drawings, their floor plan drawings, their section drawings, so those are cut through the building vertically. Um, you would provide those drawings to your consultant team as backgrounds, and then the consultant team would go in and they would draw in their ducts, they would, they would route all their ducts, they would specify where certain uh, structural members would go, so they would specify where beams of a certain depth are required because of structural calculations. But this was all done primarily in, in two dimensions, and it was done primarily in a, in a way that the drawing was divorced from the actual properties of, of, of each beam that was being drawn, right? It was just simply line, once again, line works that was being created, lines that were drawn, and then that were either um, provided in a table of values about what that particular beam was or it was labeled 
it wasn't actually associated in a smart way in real time within the software. So what's incredible about Revit, the BIM software, is that the 3D modeled BIM model that we create, we can trade off with our structural engineer now. Instead of them translating two-dimensional data line work to three-dimensional data about the structural properties or the, the duct routing, now they can actually model their ducts in 3D. And yeah. And each one of those ducts has a property. So instead of it being a schematic line on a page, it's now a you know a 30 inch wide duct that has a certain yeah. air volume that yes. has every every line item of its Damn. properties on it. So it would start as like a 2D line being the duct. Yeah. And then it, exactly. it and then you would actually make it this actual rectangle that has an air volume and then that would plug into the rest of the three-dimensional model. Exactly. That, yeah, that's really cool. And it's powerful because it, it allows for what we, we typically term um, clash detection. So as you can imagine, um, when you go inside a typical building, you, you often see those kind of gridded ceilings, the yeah. what we call ACT, acoustical ceiling tiles, right? It's kind of that, yeah, yeah. I would argue, not the most aesthetically. Totally, you know, moving away from that. <laughs> well, hopefully moving away <laughs> yeah. from that. But above that, you often find all the guts of the building, right? It's the, all your ducts are routed through all, there, all your, your structural members are up there. So that's stuff that's happening in three dimensions. So you can imagine in the past when we were doing that in 2D. Oh yeah, most people don't even yeah. know that the guts are up there. Yeah. Are there. It's always interesting lifting everywhere. it up, moving it to the side and oh, seeing so the guts. Oh yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, so maybe yeah. your audience has done this too. But yeah. what's great about this BIM software is now all that action that's happening with the ducts, they're routing up and down, they're changing vertically, they're, they have to route around uh, water piping, they have to route around yeah. structural members. Instead of trying to make sure we're not screwing that up in 2D, we can actually 3D model and coordinate that yeah. um, together. Like we can trade models that are 3D. So okay. it's powerful. All right, that's yeah. so cool. Bit on the technical side. Geeking that, out here. Geeking out. I, geek love out. I love There's it. There's some interesting ways for you, for us to be able to better understand the nuance of things. Literally, yeah. just look at one of those acoustic tiles, lift yeah, it up, move it over to the side, and just look up into that space because you'll yeah. see some interesting stuff. Also, when you're just in buildings, just think about the hundreds of people that went into the process of designing and architecting and moving the materials yeah. there, everything. I want to ask you about this. Major move of human animals to metropolises. Wow, okay. Okay, yeah, so yeah. human animals are moving by the droves to Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, Beijing, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, Paris, etc. We're moving to metropolises, away yes. from the rural environments. You and I went from Sioux Falls, South we Dakota, did. with 150,000 people, to these multi-million person cities. So. Yes. How are how do you see what's happening there with people moving away from the three thousand square foot houses into the three hundred square foot shoebox Love apartments? Yeah. So tell us about what you see with that transition and what that means with architecture and design. Yeah, you know, Alan, this is so timely because I uh, I was actually just at a talk last week. I, I, you were still here. We, we, I think I, I mentioned this to you. I was at a talk with the Urban Land Institute and. Uh, there was a company, uh, the CEO of a company called Ollie that was speaking there. And so Ollie's a pretty unique business. They, they're, I, I, I can't comment exactly on what they do in terms of their classification, whether they're a developer or a consulting agency, but what they've managed to do is to uh, crack the code, the building code in New York City to allow micro units, which by micro units we mean sub 300 square foot yeah. apartments. Uh, to be buildable by code in, in New York City. Um, but on top of that, what they've done is not only allow that to happen practically, to uh, allow it to be financially viable, to allow it to be uh, ethically and legally viable. Well, maybe, I don't know about ethically, but legally viable. Um, they've also layered on this whole other approach about um, this not just being about a, a, a a lack of space in cities, which you know, in some ways, it's driven by that. These these um, first tier cities are, are they're yeah. running out of space in, in some ways, or they're running out of, out of reasonably priced space. We'll yeah, say. That's good way to put it. Um, so it's not only solving the problem of putting more people in a smaller space. It's it, as as I would say, it's it's also solving a cultural problem, right? So I I would I would take it to the next level and say that. All this stuff is equally happening because of cultural reasons that it, that are probably uh, driven in large part by social media. The um, network effect. Yeah, 
yeah, people want well, to live too. among other yes. high uh, profile productive people roaring yeah. in the metropolises you want to be closer yes. to millions of people and also you're, you're talking about these shoebox style designs where literally the beds are folding up into the walls yeah. the couches can push into the walls and out and you can sit on and push them into the wall the dressers can be pushed into the wall pulled out yeah etc this is so um, uh, modular yeah yeah and, and and what I liked about how Ollie framed it up was they said why why have we always thought about apartments and housing as distinct from products like product designs and commodities and and consumer goods because at the end of the day I mean in some ways that is what you're providing if you're if you're a developer of apartments you're providing a product that uh, that folks can can buy like can buy into they can rent so in that sense, that product needs to have all the features, right? It, it's not just the space you're giving them. You're giving them a whole built-out space in the case of this company. As you're saying, like every, all the necessary baseline furniture is built into the walls. It's, it's specifically catered so that you can come in on, it, you can come in on an Uber with your, your, your bag of stuff, your couple duffel bags, and you're set for the, the next year or two years. You don't need to bring anything else to the table, and um, and what I also thought was incredibly compelling is they, they weren't uh, just solving the problem of the individual unit; they were also folding in this idea of how do we make Ollie a lifestyle brand? How yeah. do we make it? Uh, how do we have this uh, community organizing element that they actually provide each of their residents uh, a membership to their club, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a social club too. It's it, the building has shared amenities, which a lot of apartment yes. buildings have. But they've kind of institutionalized as part of the business model, as part of buying into that unit. If, if you pay rent, you're automatically part of this social club that has events, that has ski trips, that has a whole, you know, yep, whole, dinners, fitnesses, yeah. all this different type of stuff. Which not to, I feel like I'm just yeah, pitching, pitching this company. So, but, so anyway. quick, quick, uh, yeah. quick bit on that. It's really crazy that millennials and Gen Z. You mentioned it earlier, just kind of in the most crazy way, moving into these urban environments yes. with just a couple duffel bags right now and everything's already... I did that. Yeah. I don't know if you yeah, did Yeah, totally. Yeah, that. we just yeah. move in with a couple totally bags into these environments. Yeah. And what else is, is looking to be crazy is that it's transitioning into even, you don't even need your duffel bags anymore. You don't even need yeah. your computer and your phone. You just go and you log into the already existing technical infrastructure, yeah. the spatial computing infrastructure in that yeah. location, and the clothes that you need this is already all connected to the artificial intelligence grid where they already know your you know your shoe size your couple pieces of clothing you need at that location at that time all part of the shared economy etc yeah. so all very very interesting as you travel from city to city um, okay a uh, couple things um, on the way out it's um, I'm I want to I want to I want to talk about this because this seems to be the, uh, in many ways the future we've seen things like the venus project we've seen things like arcology taking over architecture and ecology mixed together mm -hmm. we've been talking a lot about moving away from monolithic buildings into into porous green architecture sustainable architecture taking ethos as a principal communicative yes. design all this stuff so where do you see the future of the architecture and design where do i see the future uh well, I mean, I, I, in a way, I kind of want to um, double back on what we were just saying. In some ways, well, you kind of fed me a, a good answer here. It's almost, it's kind of the we work workification of space as well, right? That, that uh, perhaps in a way, um, architects might be necessary in a different way. We're, we're designing systems and, and opportunities less than we're designing uh, custom one-off happenings right that it's more about understanding how we're implicated in creating the systems that people arrive in and plug in and and, and I think it's also probably about coming together as well as a field because I, I think architecture has always been a disparate field of, of kind of singular individuals or ideologies which I think you find in any any discipline or practice and and I think it's the political nature of humans that generates that. But I, I do think architects' power is in, is in numbers because I, I do feel like society has not 
fully understood what we do um, and why we're, we bring value or how we bring value beyond just being the people that are on the ground kind of drawing the buildings and, and going to the building department and making sure that everything's code compliant, all the, all the practical parts of delivering it. But it's, we're also the people that, that create human experience in a way because yes. The, the spaces we're in, if that's the thesis of this conversation, yes, in a way yes. they influence the way we think, yes. the way we feel, the way we uh, make decisions. Um, yes, yes, yes. That's very well understood in retail architecture. I, frankly, I'm kind of excited to see uh, other people outside of our, our typical boundaries see the value in architecture. There was, I'm going to give you an example, and maybe your your audience can look into this further if they're interested. This was talked about quite a bit here in LA, so. There's a really prominent architectural school down the way, literally probably a mile or two from here. It's called a, a SciArc, which is the Southern California Institute of Architecture. And very recently, uh, Kanye West actually showed up unannounced with a, a crew uh, of his, his, of his, uh, his compadres um, to walk through the student reviews there, the student design project reviews at SciArc. Sweet. And this got very well published because uh, obviously we know Kanye has a, you know, he's kind of a well-known cultural figure. But it, it, it gave architecture a moment. And yes. a lot of people have, have been writing about this happening and, and been talking about what happened. And we had our five minutes of fame in a way, oddly enough, yeah. that architects are forgotten about. But Kanye uh, gave us a, a, a micro spotlight for a moment that, that him thinking as this kind of visionary person, thinking that architecture had real gravitas in society, um, gave us a little bit of credence and a little bit of yeah. um, muscle in a way. I think we're moving towards an era of people that see <clears throat> the architect and designing from a perspective of these do directly influence the way that we communicate with each other, that we think, like you said, this thesis of this yeah. conversation. And so I'm glad you brought that. What, okay, I want to ask a couple questions on the way out. Awesome. What would you say is a core driving principle of your life? Core driving principle. Growth. Yeah, to put it simply, I, uh, well, something I like to say uh, to people or that I found myself saying quite a bit is, uh, it's, it's, maybe it's trite in a way, but my two favorite things in the world are people and, and learning. So if I can find a person I can learn from, I'm just like set. So uh, <laughs> I would say that's, that's often how I end up, end up pursuing various social relationships or when, when I f really feel myself drawn to a person or, or an experience, it's, it's usually because that experience or person is, is, whether directly or indirectly, inspiring me or bringing, bringing new ideas to me. And I, I think certainly I, I would argue that that's maybe why there was immediate kind of Bond conduit between, between us, you and I. Because totally. I think we're probably drawn to that same exactly. approach. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, we just started day one when From we showed up. growth with and that. learning with yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So. I love that principle. That's a really good one. So, so growth, uh, learning, and people. People, yeah. Th that's so good. Yeah. Um, how about if you could rebuild civilization from mm. scratch, how would you design it? Uh, so, first I want to ask, is that the physical world or is that the structure of society, politics? Structure of civilization. Okay. Um, I think... I think one of the... the biggest missed opportunities that exist is that we have a world filled with people that don't know how much potential they actually have and maybe that's I don't know maybe that I don't I, I hope that's not throwaway and I hope it, it's not superficial and it's good dive deeper into why you say yeah, that okay. yeah okay I, I think we're a world that's and I don't want to come off just like a um, rational utopianist but maybe I am um, we are in a world that's driven so so profoundly by people's impulsive emotions in a way right and and people's um judgmental emotions and people's um deluding emotions so i i think what we really need to to or in, in this hypothetical question where i'm restructuring humanity we we need to find a, a way through society that we 
basically um, I'd allow people to, to step outside of their immediate feelings because I think at the end of the day, this, this kind of political battle that we're having, um, this kind of ideological battle that we're having, people don't understand that that's happening on the level of individual people's personality, psychology, and emotions, right? And that it's not necessarily that there's one right political answer or wrong political answer. We are just, we are simply acting in the world as a direct result of, of what's going on up in our individual dome, right? That uh, we're predisposed because of personality type to, to see the world in a certain way. We're, we're biased. Beyond experience, we're biased personality and psychologically speaking. And I, I don't know how you structure the world I, in a way that you help people step outside of that for a moment and, and, and mm -hmm. see, if, zoom out 40,000 feet and be like, wow, um, if I could be empathetic and, and really understand why this person thinks that or why this person is doing that, or in any number of things, I, I think to allow a structure that facilitates that for a broad population would would reap incredible results. Um, yeah. Because there's there's so much value tied up in people too. There's so much latent value because yeah. you have this world filled with people that um, that have already made up their minds about what what their opportunity is or what what they're capable of or who they are. And I, I would say that with myself. I mean, maybe this is just. Uh, a personal thing and a projection of my in, internal world that I found that through experience and through time that and once again this is maybe this is trite but it's it's you it's all about how you frame what you think your identity is like there's always going to be people that are going to try to tell you what your identity mm -hmm. is but if we can in mass empower people to define their own identities that's so, really good. Yeah, yeah, I like that as I, a design principle for. And for I'm not humanity. sure how you right, and I'm not sure yeah. practically how, how to it do it. Yeah, yet, but I. Um, a lot of it yeah. has to do with uh, degrees of freedom. So, sure. so raising the baseline for basic needs to be met, yeah. and then yeah. degrees of freedom. It's Maslow's for, hierarchy. It's yeah. Maslow's yes. Pyramid yes. So the basic needs are met to the point of like self-actualization. Yeah. So there's unconditional love and all these other basic needs, exactly. and then. From there, the degrees of freedom are free of equality of opportunity, go pursue whatever you'd like, but just know that in order to actually build something at the, at the tippy top scales, it's gonna require a lot more work than if you want to potentially just do something a little more relaxing um, in your day-to-days and whatnot. Okay. Anyway. Um, two more. Got it. Are we in a simulation? <laughs> I love it. Um, are we in a simulation? Well, I, a question like that I would want to start with, I think we have to define simulation first, right? That's probably okay. the most important part. So a simulation implies inherently that you're recreating or you're, you're creating, maybe not a false version, but an alternative, a recreated version of something else, right? Because a simulation, let's say... Is this base reality or a simulation? Right. Is this the actual Earth that evolved from the Big Bang orbiting a star, or is this a simulation of all of the laws of maths and physics that are just existing in a place that is not the actual physical reality? <laughs> right. But bizarrely, what I like about this is, is in order for the concept of a simulation to even exist, right, it assumes that there is this other alternative universe that we're mirroring or that we're, we're kind of copying. So I, I would say... That seems like a pretty elaborate ruse. I would say that it's probably not a simulation. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think so. I don't. Okay. Last question. Yeah. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Wow. Oh. Um, hmm. <laughs> I think I have an answer, maybe in a way, but. Uh, um, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. How about I give you an abstract answer and a tangible answer? Uh, I think the most beautiful thing in the world abstractly is truth. And I think the most beautiful actual physical thing in the world is uh, perhaps it's uh, still abstract, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say I want women. women. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, <clears throat> I, love, I, love, I love those answers. Um, tell us, a quick bit on why truth and why women. Sure. Um, 
truth because it's incredibly empowering. And I think that's sort of what I was alluding to in your earlier question regarding uh, how do we, if I was to idealize and, and manifest uh, an yeah. ideal society, it would be one driven by truth, which is kind of an ancient idea. You know, there's ancient philosophers yeah. that talked about that, but we still do today. Yeah, and right. We're still digging and figuring things out. But easier to self-actualize people when the degrees of the foundation of truth are actually yeah. present in the education of every child. 100%. Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't know the truth, how do you, uh, how do you work from that, that space of falsehood, essentially? You can't build a, you can't build yeah. a, a building on a, 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 a broken fake, foundation. Broken foundation. Yeah. So to me, that's, in, in summary, that's what truth is. And women? And women, well, I mean, <laughs> there might be obvious reasons as a male that, um, I, I, but I, I think what I find particularly fascinating about that answer and that way of framing it up is that it's both this very um, biological, maybe, and, and, mm -hmm. and um, an instinctual appreciation of this difference um, or this, or yeah. this kind of a, um, what would you say? Um, it's like a companion to the, yeah, to the man. Yeah, yeah, right. It feels like somebody who they're, and I, and I also want to, I want to preface this with saying that I'm, I'm, I'm certainly somebody who, it yeah, like believes in quality. Yeah, yeah. believes in a broad spectrum of, of types of people and types of yes. conceiving your gender and your identity. Sure. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to frame it up in some sort of sure, sure. weird kind of black and white binary sort of way, way but yeah. binary way, but, um, I, it's almost like it, it's more of an appreciation for, uh, A set of traits that are maybe in some ways I feel um, different than mine or complementary um, that I, I do find that maybe we'll just say the feminine spirit in a broad sense um, I think often um, can manifest a, a sense of compassion a sense of yes um, of relational value yes. that I think sometimes we, we get in we get on our high horse and we come into situations and we want to we want to be dogmatic and we want to intervene. And I mean broadly, um, um, people want to do that, but I think maybe that archetype represents a desire to understand first rather than to, to, to um, intervene and to... Yeah, that's, um, that's very interesting. There's a, just a couple things there. Um, the, the rising of the feminine spirit to commingle with this masculine spirit that we've built a lot of civilization with Mm. is super exciting times. It's super exciting yeah. times is to see what actually happens. Uh, we we like running simulations of what civilization would have evolved like if it was a matriarchy. Yeah. Could have there been a deeper sense of compassion and understanding um, and maybe less war potentially. Who who, who knows? Um, where would innovations be? How green or peaceful, etc. All these different kind of things. Also, women in general, this is everything from like a mother Yes. Yes, to us who we absolutely love and adore all the way to the women that we engage with in like a formal like business sort of sense that are yeah. giving incredible ideas for building civilization, but also in a romantic sense as well, um, adoring yeah. the female as well. So this is like, um, this is such a beautiful way to, I'm happy you said that as an answer. I think we're too politically correct to even sometimes say that. So I'm glad yeah. you did in truth. So many profound takeaways from this conversation, Evan. This has been such a pleasure. Wow. Thank you so much yeah, for joining same, us on the show. Same, same. So generous. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so <laughs> we much. Love you, man. It was so much fun. I love you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Awesome. And super, super important to take away this principle of understanding the communicative fabric with which we architect and design our world and really getting behind the the, the eyes of the people that have built civilization, the buildings we walk through, the complexity of them, the software that's now being used to help make it happen, the ethos of communication. This is all super exciting. Go and think about that more. Mull that over more. Write your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Check out Evan's links below as well. And keep supporting awesome artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in, like Evan, like ourselves. Keep supporting it so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site and doing epic shows like this. And go and build the future, everyone. Go and manifest your destiny into the world. Create, build. We love you so much, and we will see you soon. Peace. That's it, my man. Love it, man. That was great. That's it.